I'm Jeffrey, and right now we are going to look at the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Law of Moses, the Pentateuch, or most commonly, the Torah. Now, Torah means law. It's a Hebrew word, and these books of the Bible were written in Hebrew. And we're going to look at why we would use the word law to describe all of this here pretty soon. Now, I say all of this because, as you can see, there is a lot of material on this whiteboard. So if you want to take a look at a photo of what I have up here and follow along, then you can follow a link to the page on the Torah uh, in the description of this video. Also, before we jump in, I should let you know that I have an individual video on each one of the five books of the Torah already made. I whiteboard our way through their stories and structures. So if you want more detail on any of these, you can watch a video on that. I've already got that made for you. There are links to those in the description as well. Now, let's go ahead and get a high level look of what we're talking about when we're talking about the Torah, what it's about, and then we're going to see how the five individual books come together to make the foundation of the Bible. Now the Torah is very important because if you don't have a Torah, you don't have a Bible. Everything that we find in the pages of scripture from here on out has its roots in the events and promises that you see here in these five books. So this is super important. Another thing that we should know going into this is that whenever uh, someone in the New Testament, uh, Jesus or Paul or Peter, is talking about the law, they're usually referring to the Torah. Let's jump in and get an idea of what these books are about. Now, the Torah begins with Genesis, and from a high-level view, Genesis gives us the origin stories of Israel's relationship with God and their ancestors. In the first half of Genesis, we see God creating and ruling the cosmos. Uh, and then, by the time we get to an event that's known as the Tower of Babel, we see uh, the relationship between God and humanity, and also the relationship between God and other spiritual beings uh, in, a, in a state of disintegration. Uh, humans are scattered and being violent toward each other. We have uh, other spiritual beings that are in rebellion against God and seeking to bring about harm on, on humans as well. So it's not a very good situation. And what we have in, uh, in the book of Genesis is we have humans scattering uh, and becoming different nations. And later on in the book of Deuteronomy, we find that the ancient Israelites believed that at that time, the, the different nations split up and they were assigned different gods. So different nations had their own pantheons, uh, which we see with the ancient Hittites, we see it with the ancient Chaldeans, we see it with uh, especially the ancient Egyptians, they're probably the most famous. And so while humans are splitting up into different nations with different gods, the god that the Israelites believed was above all of them, ruling the entire cosmos, chooses a man named Abraham directly. In fact, he makes a series of promises to Abraham. Uh, he promises to be with him as a protector and guide. He promises to give him a special land on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and that land is called Canaan. Uh, he promises to give him many descendants, and he promises that from Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So although God and humans are uh, at odds with one another, God does plan to bring a blessing about for everyone. And all of that is set up in the book of Genesis. And it ends with some of Abraham's descendants finding their way to Egypt to escape a famine. DIY is a humongous library of hands-on projects and how-to videos focused on all the Fast forward a little while and we find ourselves in the book of Exodus where Israel is uh, a mighty group of people but they're enslaved by the Egyptians. And what happens in the book of Exodus is God rescues Israel from Egypt and he doesn't just free them from their human oppressors. Instead, he frees Israel from both their human and their divine oppressors. Uh, we see God going to war and executing judgment on the gods of Egypt, or so the, the ancient Israelites uh, wrote about. And so when this happens, God leads Israel out into the wilderness and makes a special pact, a special agreement with them. He gives them the law. 
And this law isn't just like a series of rules. Uh, really, it's a Solomon binding agreement between two parties. And it's very common, uh, or it shares some commonalities with some political agreements that were made way, way back in the ancient Near East. And this kind of agreement was called a covenant. Now, in ancient times, you would have mighty kings and then lesser kings. Uh, and the mighty kings were called suzerains. These are powerful kings that could exert force over smaller kingdoms. And what would happen is uh, it would be in the suzerains and the, the lesser kingdoms, or the vassals, best interest to instead of fighting each other, look out for each other. Now, these old agreements had a lot of things in common and some things that we find in the rest of the Torah. Uh, we have a history of the suzerain's generosity. Oftentimes, the mighty king would, would write about how he had freed the smaller kingdom from some other mighty king or some other suzerain. We had laws and expectations for the vassal. If you're going to be part of the suzerain's empire, then you need to play by their rules. There would be blessings that the suzerain would give to loyal vassals, but there would also be curses that the vassals would incur if they were to break those laws. And then there were some rituals for remembering this relationship and keeping it on people's minds. That's stuff that was going on between humans in the ancient world. And they would usually invoke their own gods, the gods of their various nations, uh, to, to bear witness to this agreement. But what we see happening in the book of Exodus is different because instead of a human king offering that sort of relationship to a smaller nation, we see the god of the cosmos offering that relationship with Israel. He says, I've rescued you from Egypt. So uh, again, the Caesarean's generosity. He's, he's rescued Israel from Egypt, and he's going to bring them to that land that he promised to Abraham. But in order for Israel to maintain this relationship, then they're going to have to keep some terms. These are God's expectations of Israel. And there are many, many terms, many rituals that are explored throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but they all boil down to two basic commands. God wants love and loyalty. Israel is not allowed to worship other spiritual beings, and God also expects love and respect for other humans. This is where, this is where you get laws like, don't murder, honor your father and mother, don't steal, those kinds of things. This is God's expectation for Israel. If Israel can do this, then they can inhabit the land of Canaan. And that's introduced here in Exodus. And because we have these terms in order to uh, keep the relationship going, uh, this is called the law, or in Hebrew, the Torah. So that's why, that's why we have that name for all of, of these works. In Leviticus, God comes to dwell among the people. Uh, God is, uh, his, his presence is manifesting like a fiery cloud. And he moves in with this nation of mortals to inhabit a portable temple called a tabernacle. It's just a very special tent. And so Israel needs to figure out, well, how do we deal with such a powerful being living among us. And that's what the book of Leviticus explores. There are different rules and rituals that the ancient Israelites believed would make it, uh, make it possible for them to coexist in the presence of such a mighty being. Next, in the book of Numbers, we hear about that famous 40-year journey from the mountain outside of Egypt, Mount Sinai, to the edge of the Promised Land. Now, in Numbers, things start going really south because the people of Israel rebel against God. Uh, they forfeit the promised land for a little while, and then they have to deal with the consequences. An entire generation uh, turns on God and uh, says, We're, we don't believe that you're going to hold up your end of the bargain, which is a dangerous thing to uh, tell the person who's demonstrated a history of uh, generosity. So they say, we don't believe you're going to help us take the land. So we're not going to go. We're going to go back to Egypt. 
and God says, no, you're not going to go back to Egypt, but he does meet them halfway, and they don't enter the promised land. Instead, they have to wait 40 years for a new generation to make the choice as to whether or not they are going to uh, remain loyal to God. During those 40 years, though, God both disciplines the disobedient Israelites, uh, but he also preserves them and protects them from their enemies along the way until a new generation can make a choice. And then in Deuteronomy, we see Moses giving Israel that choice. Now, Moses is this iconic, ancient, great prophet that the Israelites believed was the mediator of this covenant. He was the go-between for God and the people of Israel. And right as Moses is about to die, Moses gives this new generation of Israelites a choice. He says, remember, we have this existing relationship with God. So, are you going to choose the blessings of keeping the Torah, abiding by the laws that have been set down? And if, if they do that, then they're going to get to enjoy the land and they'll get to enjoy God's protection. Everything will be great. Or are they going to choose the curses? If they break the Torah, then they face the risk of God's discipline, and they also face exile from the land, which we see all of these things playing out in the rest of the Old Testament, both blessings when Israel keeps the Torah and curses and eventually exile from the land. Now, this all comes together to give us this, this picture. Uh, we see these promises that God has made and this agreement that God has made with Israel in order for them to keep the land. And for the rest of the Old Testament, this is going to be a point of tension. We're going to meet many, many prophets who are going to remind Israel uh, and Israel's leaders uh, about this agreement that they've made with God and try to call them to be loyal to God and, and remain faithful to these laws and this covenant. And sometimes Israel obeys and things start to go better for them. And other times they don't obey and things get worse. So this sets up the tension between God and Israel. God wants to have a good relationship with his special nation, but every generation of Israelites needs to make the call. Are they going to accept that offer or are they going to try and make this work on their own? And the story of those choices form the rest of the Old Testament. So that's the Torah. That's how it all comes together, and you can see why this is foundational to the rest of the Bible. Now, if you want to know more about the Torah in context of the rest of the books of the Bible, and also some other really important covenants that happen between God and humans, I would encourage you to check out my ebook. It's the Beginner's Guide to the Bible. And if you read that, you'll walk away with a good understanding of what the Bible is, what it's for, and what it's all about. Also, if you would like to see more videos like this, you should subscribe to this YouTube channel. That way, you'll get notified just as soon as the next one goes live. I'm Jeffrey with Overview Bible. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful.